And I think we're just waiting on Bill. I see Bill. Will Shigar. Is that me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, I'm here. Hi. Wonderful. Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> All right, and and Bill Vernava, he confirmed, yeah, 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 he confirmed. Oh, maybe he's having a struggle mm -hmm. entering. Do you have me a ping him? Yeah, I just emailed him and I um, okay. CC'd you. All right, we'll wait for one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. All right. Um, Aaron, can I try to share? There we go. <laughs> All right. I think we will go ahead and get started. I believe the recording is already started. There you go. All right, lovely. Well, colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you're joining us from today. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'm the director of the Engineering Global Development Team at ASME, and I also serve as the president of Engineering for Change. Today's webinar is part of the Waves to Water Prize programming presented by the U.S. Department of Energy's Wave Power Technologies Office, or WPTO, for those of you who are new. And for any of you that are new, the prize was launched three years ago with the goal of enabling the development of small, modular, cost-competitive desalination systems. After five stages and numerous competitors, the prize concluded last month with one grand prize winner and four other finalists. And I wanna congratulate everyone who participated. And of course, a special congratulations to the winners and finalists. And an additional congratulations to our collaborators at uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and WPTO on the incredible program that supported these cutting edge solutions. Well done. Next slide, please. Yep. So today's uh, webinar, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about that. As implementing partners for the Waves to Water Prize, Engineering for Change had the pleasure of working with the participating teams, uh, helping them scale their innovations. Today's webinar will serve to provide insights on how to ensure that you're delivering value to your key stakeholders by applying human-centered design. We will hear provocations from leaders in the innovation sector and a panel of experts representing potential customers and key stakeholders of wave-powered desalination solutions. I will serve as one of your moderators today, along with my colleague, Aaron Pfeiffer. The webinar will be archived on E4C's site and on our YouTube channel, and both of those URLs are listed on this slide. And if you're following us on Twitter today, please do join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag. Hashtag E4C webinar series. So um, as we get going, for those of you who might be new to Teams or uh, haven't uh, used the platform before, and just generally who are joining us, we would love to see where you're from. So I, I wanna invite you to type in your location that you're joining us from today in the chat uh, window. Uh, so if you are uh, not seeing the chat, you should be able to click the little chat icon in the bottom of the slides, in the middle of the slides, and be able to uh, get uh, that um, to pop up and be able to uh, note where you are joining us from. There we go, I see folks coming in. We have uh, Minnesota, Quebec, Illinois, UK, Ethiopia, Port Collins, very good, Colorado, 
Welcome everyone, such a pleasure to have you here. Do let us know where you're from. You can use uh, this window to type in your remarks. Uh, typically, uh, we actually look for a Q&A, but uh, in Teams that's not there, apologies for the misrepresentation, but do welcome you to use uh, the chat uh, to type in your remarks or any questions, and you can always raise your hand if you have a question. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. We're so thrilled to have you. Uh, from throughout the world and across the United States and Canada. So before we move on to our presenters, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a leading knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by vulnerable communities as embodied in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. E4C's perspective cuts across geographies and sectors, including ICT, energy, water, sanitation, transport, health, habitat, and agriculture, providing pathways to connect, learn, explore, and freely access critical knowledge and networks to advance the social sector. E4C members access news and thought leaders, just as you are today, insights on research and hundreds of essential technologies in E4C Solutions Library, professional development resources, and unique opportunities to contribute to the social sector. In addition to this, E4C provides impact services to a variety of mission-aligned organizations. Our impact service leverage a proven methodology for supporting social entrepreneurs as they move technology innovations from concept to testing to scale up. Programs focus on de-risking ventures by assessing their strengths and weaknesses and providing strategic and technical guidance to get them to their next stage of development. Through this work, E4C taps into our network of innovators, inventors, engineers, manufacturers, designers, and product developers, and blend virtual assessment with rigorous in-person boot camps. Impact services deliver timely access to customized guidance that effectively propels ventures and accelerates mission-aligned organizations forward. And we've been proud to be delivering these services to NREL as part of our engagement with the Waves to Water Prize, amongst other organizations that you see listed here. Now, um, I mentioned uh, that today we're going to be focusing on human-centered design and really refining value propositions. So with that, I'd like to uh, transition to our expert, leading expert on the topic, Ms. Itika Gupta. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Itika is a founding partner at Studio Carbon and ID, an IDEO alum. She currently leads Studio Carbon in the Netherlands and India, working at the intersection of design systems thinking and storytelling to build solutions for an abundant and thriving future. Itika's experience is in circular design, human-centered design for business development, ethos design, and strategy for business and life cycle analysis. She is the, also the co-founder of Dungsi, which brings in-house bio-based material innovation to the market. She's a bachelor's of technology in electrical and electronics engineering and a master's of design, industrial and product design. We are incredibly excited to have Itika join us today from the Netherlands. And before I turn it over to Itika, I would like to invite our participants, particularly those of you who represent uh, teams to please take uh, 30 seconds to type in what you consider to be your value proposition for your venture into the chat. And so as you do that, I think, um, are we turning, uh, Aaron, you're gonna be advancing the slides for Itika? Okay, there we go. Itika, the floor is yours, welcome. Thank you, Yana. Hi everyone, lovely to be here. I'll wait for a few more seconds to see if people can tap in there value proposition, so we get to know a little bit about their innovations. I'll put on wine. So Dangsi, which Yana was mentioning well, a couple of minutes back, uh, our value proposition is we build the future with shit. Um, I'd love to hear some more from the rest of you. I see John, Gilbert, Matthew, Roos, Brett. Okay, while we wait for everyone to type this in, let's just jump in and ask the first principle question of what is a value proposition and what is the purpose of a value proposition? 
Um, it's a question we all ask every time we develop a new business, a new idea, a new innovation, uh, or simply decide about how to scale uh, our existing idea or business uh, to another country or another region. In most cases, the way theoretically we'll define a value proposition is a promise. It's a promise that we're making to our customers, to the rest of our stakeholders of what kind of value or what kind of benefit or what kind of solution um, or what kind of problem solving does our solution do for their needs. These needs could be conscious needs, they could be subconscious needs of our customers. The value proposition also encompasses the USP of the work that we are doing. So how are we different from our competitors? How are we faster, better or more in some way from an existing solution that in the market? A value proposition ideally should also be talking about a holistically writer solution for a problem. No problem has an ultimate right or an absolute right solution. We're all always striving for a slightly more writer solution than the one that preceded us. And that way our value proposition should encompass that holistically. So it takes into account how our solution is better economically, technologically, culturally, um, socially, and in multiple other facets. A value proposition should also ensure that it's talking about a long-term promise. It's talking about an impact that it's making to a customer's life in the long term. And finally, it should also be written or drafted or pulled out and emerged in a way where it is talking about and guiding us for the strategy of growth. Say today I'm I'm doing I'm making a product with an X technology. How do I decide of the next new innovation that I need to make? What should that next new innovation be? A value proposition as a brand, as a company, should be addressed with every new uh, scale up strategy that we decide for. So taking all of that into account, let's start with a couple of examples of value propositions of four very very different businesses. And from there, we'll move into a quick tool that I think could also help all of you in defining more clearly your value propositions. I see some of those in the chat already. So Water Bros provides lightweight, portable, wave-powered desalination units that can easily be deployed. William, thanks a ton for sharing that. Uh, let's use that as a quick example. I love to, I mean, it's, it's wonderful for me to understand that you're selling a desalination unit, they are better because they are portable, because they are lightweight and they are wave powered. But if I, as a customer, am deploying it or using it, uh, I'd love to know more of what does portability do for me? Does it make moving it from one room to another easier? Does it make it um, easier for me to move it from one uh, location in a city to another? Or what? I mean, portability as a word could mean many things. So maybe rephrasing our value proposition to how it's solving my problem, where portability is a feature, it's not the solution. So maybe talking about a solution could be great. Because it's portable, because it's lightweight, it's also portable. Again, how does lightweight add any value to my day-to-day -day use of a desalination unit if I'm going to keep it in one place all the time? Would be a great way to talk about value proposition. Now, this company you see on the screen is a company based in South Africa. They're, they're called Dehoven and their innovation is called Bioka. They make fully automated panels for floors, walls, and ceilings out of hempcrete. Now, this company is in the sector of bio-based building and construction. In that sector, there's already a market that's really bustling and building up with multiple alternatives of materials, whether we're talking about shredded wood, we're talking about cardboard, we're talking about recycled concrete, or we're talking about hempcrete. They have a fully automated system, so they make really precise buildings. They can make these buildings in a matter of six days. It really cuts down the cost of production. Um, in a house that you've assembled together in six days, it has a lifetime of at least 100 years that it's going to last. They can make tiny houses. They can make multi floried houses. And all of these things account as features for this company. But as they went down into distilling their value proposition, which encompasses all that that I just said about their USP or the real problem or a holistic solution, their value proposition and promise as a company came down to designing and creating buildings that breathe. As succinct and articulate and short as it sounds, when they were talking to their customers and they were talking to a lot of contractors that are now selling buildings to their customers, they realized that as a trend, especially after COVID with people living indoors, 
it became very important for people to start figuring out what kind of materials were they living in and around in a house you're surrounded in a capsule and everything within that capsule is what you breathe in and what you breathe in determines your physical and mental health and for that kind of a value proposition and this subconscious need that people have when they're making decisions of their next furniture or wall paint or even construction material promising buildings that can breathe became a very very clear way of communicating an innovation that is already out there in the market and yet showing them in a usp and different light than the rest of their competitors right now this company with the promise of building that breathe with hempcrete is using the same principle as their grounding idea to figure out what's the next big material that they're going to use in their innovation factories when they're thinking of the panel designs and the way they're going to frame windows and doors in it or the way they're planning assembly the same idea that breathing buildings as a promise cannot be compromised is driving their innovation engineering and decision making so that becomes one very quick and succinct idea of a value proposition of buildings that breathe let's go to the next slide thanks sarin uh this one is a company called nextem they're very different from the previous one i showed you this company makes headsets which are eeg devices they are like those little uh, cords if you have ever seen in a hospital when you're trying to map out your brain signals and you generally do it for research uh, for a lot of other health conditions like cerebral palsy these are very usual tools that doctors use in uh, very clinical and and scientific environments but next time created a headset and it's a headset that looks almost like a uh, like a cycling uh, headgear and that headset is something that's completely mobile it's a consumer product that you put on your head and once you've put on your head through a very simple to use dashboard you can actually map out and track your signals and they have softwares that are built on those signals that can help you make sense of it so every time you're sitting and reading what does your brain look like in focus what does your brain really look like when you're feeling extremely happy what happens to your brain when you are in a in a moment of grieving once you start understanding your brain better as a consumer you start looking at your brain the way you look at your body there may be a lot more that you can do to tap into the potential of your thinking and mind again the super complex super technical value proposition to be made to an end consumer that doesn't even know that this kind of a product is something they can use how do you again pull out a value proposition that talks about a a real not necessarily in this case a problem but a real potential that is untapped that i as an end user could tap and it again comes down to a simple phrase which states thinking beyond thought again talking about what that statement does to an end user or to an investor who's putting money into this business or to a researcher who's been doing a lot of brain signal interfacing you're clearly talking about yourself as a company that is fully committed through its product development its interfaces dashboard storytelling to promoting humans to think beyond the conscious thoughts that we understand and to really going beyond psychology into neurobiology and making that neurobiology accessible into my day to day lives pulling out a three phase succinct very clear a uh, very relatable very simple in its terminology uh, of a value proposition for an extremely complex and sophisticated technology let's look at one more example this one comes from another part of the world um and this is an example of a company called kakai which is building sewage treatment plants for households when this company started developing sewage treatment plants for homes and individual houses and apartments they realized that people are not very used to the idea of having an stp in their homes you know of an stp in an office in a mall in a commercial environment but never in a household like in appliance thinking of sewage thinking about everything that we flush down the toilet every single day is not the most common idea that hits our head when i'm thinking of making a house it's not the most obvious appliance that i think of when i'm looking for purchase in that case how do i draft out a value proposition where for a day to day user somebody building their next home somebody purchasing a house in an apartment building who's a very circular and a very conscious consumer how do i explain to them that this is a product that they need or this is a product that will add value to them 
Now I can tell them that it's a very modular, very quiet, self-sufficient, zero energy consuming, um, no smell STP that recycles about 95% of the water that's collected in your sewage every single day. And with some additional plugins into this product, that water can be translated into drinkable water by EU standards. So it's a very, very high quality and very, very simple product. And it works on the principles of biomimicry. But instead of talking about all the technical qualities that make it an amazing and awesome product, to build out a value proposition, which is a promise that we are making constantly to the rest of the world through our innovation, they decided to play with nomenclature and completely get away from the actual terminology that we use for this product, which is a sewage treatment plant, because sewage gives a feeling of disgust. Treatment sounds very, very technical and it sounds very, very industrial. Plant, again, sounds like a big factory, not something that I will put in my beautiful little backyard uh, to, you know, take care of my sewage every day. So they just reworded it into a value proposition of saying they're building the world's first water recovery pod. Talking about water and not sewage, talking about recovery and not treatment, and talking about a pod and not a plant is another very different way of just playing around with nomenclature and terminologies to put out a value proposition where it helps you to really call out and explain to the world that you're trying to disrupt an industry or you're trying to disrupt a sector by an innovation that the world has not seen before. And an innovation that's so obvious, that's so elegant and simple in its outcomes that it just feels stupid when you put it out of why hadn't somebody else thought of it before. And some of those kind of solutions and value propositions are the easiest to click with for people. Uh, let's look at one final example. This one comes from India, um, and it's by a company called Daily Dump. They make home composting units for people living in urban and semi-urban spaces. And Daily Dump started about 16 years ago at a time where home composting was not really a, an idea that people, especially in urban India, would adopt. It was something that we would very naturally and intuitively do in, in rural parts of the country. But Daily Dump realized that in the entire waste that's being collected in a city, more than about 60% of it is actually food waste. Because in India, we cook all our meals, a lot of vegetables, a lot of curry, a lot of water. So it's a lot of food waste. So they came up with a beautiful solution of these uh, different pots that you see in the image right now. They're made out of clay. Some of them are made out of bamboo. They're all handcrafted. They're taking up local craft and artisans to build these products. And their whole value proposition at a time when the country didn't even know that it needed it was to not say that I'm going to dump my waste or I'm putting my waste away or I'm treating my waste or I'm getting rid of my waste. But they said that we're going to work towards making waste visible and beautiful. Very, very counterintuitive and contradictory to what any other waste management company of that time and even today is doing in India. But because they entered the market saying waste is not something that we believe in as an idea, nature doesn't have a terminology or an ideology for waste, and why should we humans? So how do we reinvent our users and our customers thinking itself around waste? So they were not just putting out a product, but also trying to shift behaviors and getting people to start rethinking about something that they produced every single day. In which case, they made it their endeavor for over a decade and a half to create products and solutions that performed really well, that were very high quality. They produce waste in about six weeks without any electricity, power, or any additional additives or, or smell. But that's not what they sold. What they sold was that it's something that you can put out in your balcony, in your courtyard, in your terraces, anywhere with pride. It doesn't look like an ugly bin that you hide below your sink. And it makes you, with a lot of pride and beauty, put that waste out. It took a couple of years, but right now, Daily Dump has, is seen across the country as a pioneer into the idea of home composting. And with the world struggling with management of waste and trying to decentralize solutions of waste management, this idea of getting people to start make their waste visible and beautiful and really with try take ownership of it has gone a long way into making them sustain successfully and profitably as a business at a time where in India, every month and in every city, there's a new business for waste management cropping up. 
So that's another way in which value propositions can be about putting out an ideology that the world doesn't know it needs or doesn't know that it's prepared for, but really using storytelling to put out that ideology. And slowly and steadily through each product and narrative, you really make that ideology and association that people make for your company and your brand, making you a disruptor or a pioneer in that sector. Now, all of these four ideas, as I explained, sound again very intuitive to have to have been thought of. They sound like the right value propositions to have been made. Nothing super fancy about it. But arriving at these takes a lot of just deliberation, iteration, talking to customers, talking to all stakeholders, finding different patterns and opportunities that are there in the sector, into gaps that are there in the sector. And in the end, really defining one first principle need or tackling one first principle belief of your end user through the product that you're putting out for them. I'll give you a quick tool at this point on how that can be done. Um, and before I give you the tool, for the context, I'll give you a little story. So the story is about this guy called Rahul, who was a radio jockey, a workaholic. He loved working 14 hours a day. He loved his job. He loved his hectic life. He felt very motivated and very driven. He felt career was a really important part of of a person's identity. But in this day-to-day -day life, one day he woke up with a really bad cold and he had to go for a very urgent meeting. So he couldn't afford to take an off that day. So he took a pill, popped it down for a cold, rested for a couple of hours and voila, he was feeling quite okay and he went back to his hectic life. Now this solution worked in the short term. It was very promising. Um, it delivered what it had said it would, uh, and it got him to go back to uh, his workspace, which is what he was seeking. But eventually, if we go to the next slide, we learn that after a couple of weeks, Rahul realized that every few weeks he was getting a cold. Every few weeks he was falling ill. So he went back to the doctor to ask for a more long-term medication, to a medication that could make sure he doesn't fall ill and stays efficient. Now, the doctor looked a little bit more deeply and explained to him that he needed to start working on his diet. He needed to rest a little bit more and he needed to change his lifestyle. So there are some fundamental ideological changes that the doctor was asking him to do. They were not wrong. But when Rahul heard them, he simply just felt amused. And he constantly kept telling himself that, see, I understand what you're trying to say, but that's not something that's a solution that will work for me because... I enjoy the stress. I don't get bothered by stress. I love this fast-paced lifestyle. So I need something that can keep me on this fast-paced lifestyle and not really take me away from it. So do you have a solution? Now, the more deeply we think about it, this lifestyle hazard that he's causing himself is going to have a long-term impact on his health. And by the time he realizes it, it's already going to be probably too late because of an illness that he'll catch, which will slow him down a lot more than he would like right now. So in that case, if you were proposing or building out a solution for Rahul, how would you go about understanding him more deeply so that you can bridge and craft out a value proposition that's appealing and convincing and in, easy to internalize for Rahul? For that, I'll give you a quick tool right here. We'll go to the next slide, please. And that is our mental models iceberg. We we'll look at this iceberg from top down. Um, we'll start with any time we go as a company to solve a problem, generally we start identifying or even noticing the problem by an event that happens. In Rahul's case, the event that happened was catching a cold. If we are talking about creating a lake cleaning solution to gather the waste or an ocean cleaning solution, the event that's happening is that you can see waste floating around in the ocean or you can see wildlife um, under the ocean eating that waste. Now, from that event, if you just take a pause and dig a little bit deeper and start asking yourself, what are the patterns or trends that have happened over the time for that event to happen? In Rahul's case, you'll realize that the patterns of him catching a cold happened. He started identifying this event more seriously, that he realized that he was catching more colds and he was falling more ill each time he was sleeping less. So the event in itself may be catching a cold which needs to be solved, but it can't be solved until unless we solve the pattern of the fact that he doesn't sleep enough or the fact that he sleeps less. If we go one level deeper into the iceberg and start talking about the underlying structures that influence these patterns, 
we'll start realizing that he's sleeping less. Why is he sleeping less? Because there is more stress at his work, because he is not eating very well, and because he lives alone, he has difficulty accessing healthy food near either his home or work. So the location that he's staying in, the kind of stores that he has around, all of these factors of underlying structures are leading to him sleeping less, which is leading to him catching a cold. If we dig one level deeper of why is there more stress at work? Why is he not eating well? Why is he not working towards accessing healthy food around them? You start identifying and unraveling some assumptions and beliefs and values that he holds close to himself that basically dictate the way he makes decisions in his life. For people to adopt your solution, no matter how good it is, you need to cater to or disrupt people's belief systems. And for that, you need to understand them. In Rahul's case, you'll have to understand that for him, career is the most important piece of his identity. You have to understand that he already believes that healthy food is too expensive. You have to understand that he already believes that rest is something that's for the unmotivated. So instead of building a solution directly to help him reduce catching the cold, if you start building out solutions which are around making very quick, healthy, but very tasty foods in about 10 minutes of time every morning for the next three meals for him, or you start giving him ideas of how to catch a glimpse or a moment of a power nap or rest or a little pause in his day-to-day -day life without really sort of disrupting his routines, the chances that he'll adopt and eventually be loyal to your solution or technology or innovation or brand is much higher than if you're simply giving him a solution to catch a cold. And that as a tool, it's something that's very easily available online. You can use it and break it down for all your stakeholders. There could be a mental model you can make for each stakeholder and really break it down and try and understand that the event that you're trying to tackle of whether it's access to water, whether it is uh, cleaning up that water, whether it is providing water at a lower cost or whether it is changing behaviors about water usage, any of those solutions can be iterated, refined or pitched to a customer by mental models and value propositions woven into the mental models of those customers. I'll take a pause here. Um, let me see. So John has a question, which is what is the name of the company producing the pods? The company, John, is called Kakai. Uh, and they're working on a technology, which is a Danish technology of a company called BioCube, where they uh, use biomimicry as a first principle to naturally recycle sewage water into dr eventually drinkable clean water. Um, any other questions, if any of us has, I'd be happy to answer. Otherwise, I'll give it back to Iana. Thank you so much, Itika. Yeah, I don't think I see any other questions, but that was incredibly insightful and uh, you can probably take a peek at some of the value props that were added in the chat uh, yeah. by our participants. Um, I think a lot to work with there. Um, so with that human-centered design perspective in mind, and uh, we are now going to transition into another thought leader provocation, another insight in this instance from the humanitarian relief sector. Um, and kindly, if you are not speaking, if I can trouble you to please mute, we're getting a little bit of background noise. Thank you so much. Um, so I am going to go ahead and introduce our, our incredible speaker, Ms. Ruth Salmon, who is the Innovation Manager at Elros Humanitarian Innovation Fund. Uh, Ruth it designs and manages funding calls for innovative solutions to gaps in wash, water and sanitation, humanitarian responses. Before working at Elra, she worked for a nonprofit consultancy designing and scaling innovative financing programs in the WASH health and education sectors across East and West Africa. She has also worked in monitoring and evaluation research roles and provided technical assistance to the government of Sierra Leone for two years. She is passionate about using research and innovation to improve development outcomes and how collaboration between actors from different perspectives and schools of thought can achieve this. She has a Bachelor of Science in International Development Studies and a Master's in Research for International Development from the University of London. Welcome, Ruth, to our virtual stage. It's a pleasure to have you here to 
get some very unique perspectives on the humanitarian innovation space. Great, thank you for that introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, so yes, at Elro, we've been working to understand how best to scale innovation in the humanitarian sector for a number of years. Uh, we funded over 150 innovation teams to develop, test and scale impactful innovations. And yet we found that despite the impact, uh, the increased investment, sorry, in humanitarian innovation over the last couple of years, uh, scaling it is still a huge challenge. Uh, and this is for uh, a number of reasons, some of which are displayed on the slide at the moment. So over the next few minutes, I'll highlight some of those challenges as well as how we can flip some of them into opportunities. Um, this presentation is based on the research that Elra has done over the last couple of years, and I've linked uh, to the different reports that we produced throughout the presentation. I'll put the links in the chat uh, after as well. So in terms of the, the challenges to scaling innovation uh, within the humanitarian sector, uh, our research and experience so far uh, has kind of narrowed it down to these five. Um, so challenge number one is that too few innovations are geared to scale, uh, meaning that scalability is often insufficiently considered during the early stages of innovation development. So questions such as, is there a market for this idea? Is it financially viable? Does the does it bring value to the end user? Uh, are all questions that uh, seem very obvious, but can be lost in the excitement of developing a new product um, or trying out something uh, different uh, in the space. The second challenge is around the insufficient uh, embedded knowledge and skills for supporting scale within the humanitarian sector itself. Um, I think this is an area that's slowly improving, um, but there's still a need to consider the full range of scaling strategies available, drawing on sources from outside of the humanitarian sector and adapting them uh, to the dynamics of the sector itself. The third challenge is around funding. Uh, there is generally a lack of funding for scaling innovation, as a lot of the funding goes towards the development of new ideas and solutions and piloting those. There's a bit of a, then a funding gap for kind of scaling those ideas once they've proven uh, and have evidence to a certain level. The funding also tends to be short term, uh, so kind of one, two years uh, to lower the risk to donors. But we found that in reality, it takes much, much longer to, to scale uh, innovations in the sector, uh, more like five to seven years uh, to even begin to kind of see impact at, at a larger scale. Then thirdly, the, the funding is also often inflexible. Um, innovators are normally paid to uh, do certain activities to achieve a certain outcome. Uh, that's not really how innovation works uh, in the best instance, um, especially in unpredictable humanitarian settings uh, where the situation might change. And then the ideal scenario is that then you can adapt to that changing situation. It's also really hard to find core funding for organisations that uh, have an idea that they want to scale uh, to kind of move from an organisation being one where they're piloting an idea to one where they're moving over to a long term venture. It's really hard to get funding for them to strengthen their organisational structures and kind of make that transition. Um, so that's another barrier too. The fourth challenge is around the insufficient evidence that exists for the impact of innovations. So there's a couple of reasons for this within the humanitarian sector. The first is that there's a lack of baseline data for effectiveness on current practice. So there's nothing to compare new innovations against because there isn't evidence for what's being done currently anyway. Uh, there's also kind of patchy um, uh, evaluation of different uh, innovations rather than it being more systematic. This is due to a couple of factors. Uh, the nature of the settings themselves um, are very unstable. It also takes a large amount of funding and time to evaluate uh, an innovation or an intervention rigorously. Uh, the sector is also really fragmented in terms of what it sees uh, as enough evidence or sufficient evidence to change a practice. Um, there are very few sector-wide agreed upon evidence standards um, for what constitutes enough evidence to, to make a change. Uh, and to, to switch to a new uh, way of doing things. And then challenge five uh, is around the how the structure of the humanitarian ecosystem itself does not lend itself well to scaling innovation. Um, and I'll expand on that one in the next slide, if I can have that, please. Great, so before we move on to the opportunities, I just wanted to outline this last challenge in a bit more detail. Um, there are three barriers that make scaling uh, in the humanitarian ecosystem hard uh, specifically. 
Um, we've also invested in researching these challenges, uh, and that's in our humanitarian awash procurement report. So I've I've linked to that report as well. Uh, so these three barriers that I picked out are a draw, drawing on that research. Um, so we've seen generally that the, the underlying incentive structure of the humanitarian ecosystem can stifle innovation, um, by which we mean that humanitarians are focused on doing no harm and delivering interventions at speed to respond to a dire need that exists um, for those affected by the crisis. This can make trialing something new really tricky. Uh, field uh, responders are more likely to fall back onto the methods that they've used before in other situations, regardless of the fact as to whether there's evidence for them working well or not. Uh, they just go to the, the thing that is um, closest to hand. Um, another barrier is that procurement processes uh, in the sector are really opaque. It's often not clear what the process is for getting a new intervention into a humanitarian agency's catalogue, for example, or even who the right person is to approach to find out what the process is. Um, supply challenges can also abound in that it's difficult to find suppliers that are willing to invest in setting up production for a market that is often unpredictable. Um, or you get the flip side of that problem where agencies are locked into long term agreements to overcome the unpredictability. But that means that getting a new product into the market uh, is often quite difficult because humanitarian agencies and their suppliers are already in a long term contract to um, produce the same products. Um, then there's a third barrier that is a lack of markets that would exist in other contexts. Um, so this is around the fact that the procurement of resources for responses is dominated by several large humanitarian agencies. And yet across these agencies, there are often different specifications for very similar products, uh, making it very hard for suppliers to produce at scale. Uh, and I have an example of this on the next slide, if we can go there. Um, so this slide uh, should, if we click through, give you three examples of different humanitarian agencies uh, catalogues. So we've got UNHCR, uh, Save the Children and then Oxfam. Uh, they're all showing you the product specification or the product page for a trucking, uh, a water transport bladder. Um, and yet you can see across the different uh, catalogues, there are different specifications, there are different prices. Um, so, so yeah, it's very difficult for suppliers to to be able to produce um, something that is accepted by all of the main uh, humanitarian agencies, even though there's only a couple of them that are procuring at scale. Great. OK, so it's very clear that there are a lot of barriers. I'm sure some of you uh, were more than aware of some of these anyway. Um, so let's start to talk about uh, how we can overcome them. Uh, so I'll now outline two opportunities that exist for innovators in the humanitarian system, and this is from our ex um, our experience of working with uh, those teams that we funded uh, to scale humanitarian innovations. So the first of these is generating and using evidence to navigate the sector. So innovation teams can do this by understanding their stakeholders, enablers and constraints and aligning with them. And this is a bit similar to the examples that Itaka was just giving uh, in terms of putting yourself in your stakeholders shoes, uh, understanding uh, kind of how they perceive evidence, what evidence they might be more receptive to about your innovation, uh, when they might want to receive it and how uh, and who would be best to present it to them, kind of who do they see as a as a credible source. Uh, so the second opportunity around this is involving your stakeholders as early as possible uh, in evidence generation. Um, so giving them a role in reviewing or deciding on what evidence is collected, um, giving demonstrations to them and providing visuals of the innovation, so diagrams, videos, uh, and using those resources to really tell a story and a narrative about your innovation uh, and what role it can play and what value it brings. Uh, there's also potentially a role for peer to peer mechanisms, so um, tapping into groups or organisations uh, that already exist in the area where your, your innovation uh, sits uh, and creating buy in within these. So approaching those organisations, presenting to them um, and, and getting their, their buy in as well. And then finally, the third opportunity is thinking about what evidence stakeholders need to take decisions. Um, so producing evidence that facilitates the scaling process 
uh, the process, sorry, not just thinking about uh, evidence that your solution works or evidence of its impact. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So this slide uh, demonstrates the different types of uh, scaling evidence, uh, which is how we've come to think about it. The, the two dark blue uh, columns are kind of how we tend to think about evidence generally. So we normally think about evidence that there's a problem and then evidence that our solution solves that problem. And the other groups of evidence that we found can be really helpful in facilitating the uptake of innovations uh, are the three light blue boxes on the right. Um, so evidence that your solution is the is the right solution or for a particular context or that it has a relative advantage over other solutions. Um, so that might be uh, comparing it to other innovations, doing a value for money analysis, demonstrating the demand that exists um, for your solution within the sector. Uh, the second area is having a feasible and sustainable scaling strategy and having evidence that generate uh, that demonstrates that that's the case. Um, so one way of doing this is having a detailed implementational quality control guideline so that when you hand the solution over to uh, another actor, they know uh, how to operate it and that kind of is clearly um, clearly laid out for them. Uh, the other area of this is kind of replicability, so understanding what factors affect uh, the effectiveness of your innovation in different contexts um, and being able to predict how it will perform across different contexts. Uh, and then finally, the evidence of team capability, um, so showing uh, those that you might be approaching for funding or to adopt your innovation, uh, kind of the strengths of your team, demonstrating that you've got the right connections, that you're well managed, that you have a, a feasible scaling strategy, etc. Um, so yeah, so those are the, the different areas of evidence that we've um, started to, to think about, as well as having the evidence that your solution works. Um, and using evidence for a variety of different uh, goals, such as bringing credibility to the organization, rallying support for it, uh, helping uh, those that are adopting it to make key decisions and fulfilling um, decision makers requirements. If we can move forward to the next one, great. Uh, so that was the, the first opportunity is around kind of evidence use and generation. Uh, the second opportunity is ensuring that uh, the innovation is geared to, geared to scale from the outset. Uh, so we mentioned at the beginning that sometimes this doesn't happen. Uh, so of course, the flip side of that is to ensure that you definitely have thought about this. Um, so one way to do this is to consider scaling pathways uh, from the inception of the innovation. Um, I've put on the slide three different pathways that we've identified. Um, but this comes with the caveat that there is no one single pathway and that no two pathways for uh, scaling and innovation will ever look the same and that one pathway could be a combination of the different pathways itself. Um, so these are three examples of pathways that do exist. Uh, so the first is um, ensuring that the innovation is scaled through getting it incorporated into policy guidance or practice standards. Um, so this requires close collaboration with key decision makers at an early stage uh, to ensure that you can influence them to adopt uh, the changes into policy and practice guidelines within the sector. Another scaling pathway is uh, adoption by others. So this could be government actors, could be other humanitarian agencies. It might be through humanitarian uh, mechanisms, i.e. The, the cluster system, uh, or it could be encouraging donors to, uh, to adopt it as well. And this could be either demand driven, um, so creating enough demand that, that people take up the, the innovation for themselves, uh, or it could be adoption through encouragement or advocacy that this is something that works within the sector um, so that others elect to adopt it. And then finally, the, the third pathway is direct implementation by the originating organisation. Um, so this pathway supports innovators who are themselves uh, directly implementing or using the new innovation to scale their operations. And this can happen either directly or through a franchise or partnership model where they uh, maintain a degree of control. So that's one area is considering the, the pathways to scale. Uh, another opportunity is to think about how your innovation fits with the existing humanitarian system uh, and thinking about the degree of change that you're requiring from those that are adopting your innovation. So are you asking them to kind of modify and slightly tweak their existing practice, 
or are you asking them to create a whole new system around the innovation that you're proposing? Um, and whether the answer to that question is kind of less drastic or more drastic will then define uh, the approach that you need to take in scaling the innovation, the types of relationships that you need to develop with your stakeholders, um, and also the kind of time frame that you're thinking about uh, in terms of what change can be expected and how quickly uh, the innovation might take root. And then the third opportunity is around using uh, the growing set of tools that's available to innovators in the sector. I've linked a couple uh, on the slide um, and I will put some of those in the chat as well after I've finished. And that's all I have. Um, so, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, very useful guidance um, that can be, I think, integrated to everybody's strategies uh, immediately. So if you do have questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. Otherwise, we are, are going to transition. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to now turn the floor over to my uh, co-moderator and colleague, Ms. Erin Pfeiffer, who is the, a research manager here with Engineering for Change, uh, working with our fellows, as well as a variety of impact projects and partners at the intersection of engineering, sustainability, and global development across the sector. So Erin, the um, floor is yours to lead our panel. Thanks so much, Iana. Um, so I'd like to go to the next slide. Um, our panel will begin uh, with our panelists sharing a little bit about their backgrounds and the work that their organizations are doing related to WASH, energy, and the target market for wave, wave desalination, wave hard desalination. Um, so I'd like to start uh, now by introducing our first panelist, Will Hegard, uh, founder and operations director of Footprint Project. Um, Will, if you'd like to take a minute to introduce yourself and a little bit about uh, Footprint Project. Sure. Hi, um, it's great to be here. Um, do you want us to share screens or anything or should we just talk? I uh, feel free to to just talk and we can. Um, yeah, thanks. I love it. Keep it simple. Um, yeah, so my name is Will. I lead Footprint Project. We are a small nonprofit based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota that deploys cleaner energy to disasters to help communities build back greener. So that really looks like um, assembling and then dispatching mobile solar generator systems with batteries and solar panels to displace fossil fuel generators in the emergency um, relief uh, and response context. And then in between disasters, we develop regional networks of mobile solar generators to um, get prepared for the next uh, large power outage in that region. Um, we've been working on this since 2018, we've deployed to over 15 uh, disasters in the domestic United States, and we do have a small operation ongoing in, in Ukraine now. Um, we, our goal is to broaden that work to include more sustainable technologies holistically. So we're really excited to learn and kind of be a part participant in this uh, panel and yeah, we're we're happy to share kind of our experience deploying renewable energy technologies in these response contexts, what we see, what gets plugged in, um, and hopefully be be helpful here. Thanks so much. Well, Thanks. our next panelist today is Bill Varnava, uh, who is a mechanical engineer with the water and water technology product lead with the U.S. Naval Facilities Engineering Expeditionary Warfare Center. Uh, welcome, Bill. I know you're you're calling in. Are you able to unmute and uh, introduce yourself and the work that you do? Uh, yeah, yes. Hi, Aaron. This is Bill Barnhoff. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Hi. So, yes. Hi. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in the panel today. Um, I work for the Navy here and with the NAFAC and manage our seawater desalination test facility. So, what I basically do is we test and evaluate basically water systems and components related to um, desal water purification for um, expeditionary shipboard facility installation water systems for for the DOD and other federal agencies. And in addition, we 
um, test and evaluate uh, systems for um, you know, private groups and other interested parties. So we, our facility is kind of a unique one where we're able to pump seawater and you know, test in a real world environment you know, on a continuous basis. So um, uh, interested in you know, the idea of the wave to water concept and that it you know, could provide you know, either disaster relief uh, and or you know, installation resilience. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much, Bell. Our next panelist is Paul Tools, uh, Paul Tools, uh, CEO of WaterCycle LLC. Uh, welcome, Paul. Thank you, Aaron. Nice to uh, to meet everybody virtually. So, um, as you can see from my resume, it, it talks a lot about desalination. You know, a, a lot of my focus, um, particularly in this discussion, is for the Caribbean. Um, I was very lucky as a child to live in Jamaica for three years, so I got to really understand a little bit uh, of, of, of what happens in the Caribbean and watching storms and hurricanes uh, come in. You know, Jamaica also has uh, earthquakes, nothing like Haiti, but um, you know, a lot of natural disasters. The other thing I will say is more recently in my career in the last three or four years, and unfortunately I didn't think to put it in here, I've done a lot of work you know, with the renewable energy, so microgrid systems um, with a hybrid solutions with um, wind, solar um, and batteries. And I think, you know, adding wave uh, technology to that uh, to that system is, is definitely something to consider. So thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, and our last panelist is John Peichel, Global Market Developer with Suez Water Technologies and Solutions. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I work with a uh, Suez Water Technologies and Solutions, a global supplier of water and wastewater treatment technologies. So we manufacture membranes, we design and manufacture thermal systems, not used uh, in the desalination of seawater, but actually used on the tail end on treatment of brine in the application of zero liquid discharge. But my expertise is really in reverse osmosis membranes. And so we often, you know, we don't often get involved in the power generation aspect that feeds, say, the electric motor that powers the high pressure pump to desalinate seawater using membranes. Um, but we um, do supply, you know, permanent installations and mobile equipment that has to go into where the seawater is coming from and what is the final quality of filtered water being used for. And um, we can provide insight into new technologies um, that you know experience. If you go to the next slide, Aaron, um, thank you. I just put this one pager together just um, for people's benefit. This illustrates a couple of things around seawater desalination systems that are key you know, relative to the concentration of seawater and osmotic pressure, the use of membranes to remove that salt, high pressure requirement for running membranes, integrating energy recovery, of which I've shown a picture in the lower right hand corner. And if you go to the lower left hand corner, that's a picture of a small turbo installed on a membrane skid. And energy recovery is extremely important in seawater desalination to lower the electrical consumption or costs required to desalinate seawater. Without it, you would see a lot less commercial seawater plants in the world. And then the one in the upper right-hand corner is our smallest um, desalination membrane system, does not have energy recovery, um, but it is uh, cost-effective and often used for people that have a small inland seawater desalination well and provide a small volume of desalinated water for portable use. Um, so giving you some pictures to go with the explanation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sean, and, and thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us today. Uh, we will now move on to the moderated panel section of the discussion where we'll be covering a number of topics, including existing solutions for energy generation and water desalination, as well as technical cost and deployment considerations. Um, so I wanted to start off first uh, with a question to Will. Um, so Footprint Project deploys mobile solar solutions for emergency and uh, clean access to power. Which geographic regions? Uh, I think you've, you've covered this uh, 
the current regions that you're working in. Um, if you could uh, reiterate those. And then also in your experience, do you find energy is often difficult to source and generate in those areas, especially in the disaster relief context? Yeah, um, we deploy mostly in the domestic US simply because the equipment that we bring in is you know, large and shipping is a, is a significant constraint for any humanitarian emergency, but um, it really doesn't make sense to like put a large solar trailer in a container and ship it over to, to West Africa. It's better to build it there. Um, so energy is always a challenge in emergencies, particularly, do, you know, I think international emergencies, longer term um, remote refugee camp style um, um, challenges are, are where a lot of the cleaner microgrid technologies have been deployed. In our, you know, a lot of what we're doing is importing lessons learned from the international disaster response context and applying them to firefighters in Houma, Louisiana after Hurricane Ida or something else where there's a domestic large long-term power outage and we're we're deploying solutions that would would reduce the use of fossil fuels in those contexts um so i think it's a yes to be honest, i mean it's a yes but international long-term displacement refugee or humanitarian crisis of those scale are where you see you know unhcr investing you know a million dollars to build a microgrid for because the the payoff is for 10 to 17 years while in louisiana after hurricane ida the grid's back in, in two months you know what i mean so there's a there's a significant i think that's a really important piece of the the puzzle to think about when you're when you're deciding all right it might make more sense to deploy this equipment in international humanitarian context because the the um, the payoff over the initial investment is going to be be extended. Thanks so much, Well, And just as a quick follow up question, um, more specifically, what gaps do you see in the current solutions um, that are being deployed for energy generation? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a sign. To be honest, like on the domestic side, we're just so used to, you know, the the National Guard providing the fossil fuel supply chain if the grid's out for an extended period that there's not really create a lot of creativity going on with how to deploy newer technologies. Um, I think the the for so for the domestic, you know, U.S. response infrastructure or systems, I think the the gap is is tech, you know, creativity because the technology is really there and it's really just a logistics and finance challenge. Microgrids are ex more expensive upfront. The grid is still being rebuilt relatively quickly. And so making that cost to benefit ratio over a period of a grid outage of two months to six months is a lot harder to do than in, let's say, Bangladesh, where you have a, a refugee camp that's going to be operational for 10 years um, or longer. Um, I think in the international response space, the, the the gap is finance, right? You just need more capital to the tech still there. The the use case is there. You just need a lot more, you know, people putting their money where their mouth is. Um, but, but yeah, so I think they're different based on whether you're looking at the U.S. or or um, a more, you know, the U.N. so to speak. Thanks so much, Well, and I see that there's some questions coming in in the chat. Uh, we will leave some time at the end uh, to have the panelists answer some of those questions with an audience Q&A. So please do um, add questions to the chat as you think of them and also direct them towards um, specific panelists um, as uh, necessary. Um, so the next question is for John, uh, kind of a parallel question. So your work at Suez focuses on water technologies and solutions for more industrial or commercial applications. What gaps do you see in the current solutions for water desalination? Okay. You know, energy consumption has always been one of the primary challenges as you do large desalination plants. The whole reason membranes became popular is because it was more energy efficient than thermal evaporation and, and condensing of seawater to make potable water. But that energy consumption is not just in the membrane being used to remove the salt, but it is also in the pretreatment, the conveyance of the, of the volume of water from the ocean. And we deal with membrane fouling on seawater is one of our you know, primary challenges in operational 
efficiency of a membrane system. Membrane fouls, it needs more pressure, it needs more cleaning, you consume more chemicals. If you have downtime cleaning a membrane, it's not making water, so you have to have more membranes to make up the difference when part of your system is being cleaned. So balancing all of those energy needs from pretreatment to the actual desalination of seawater continues to be a, a challenge. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the contrast of a, you know, small humanitarian relief system where you've got a, 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 a you know, portable power supply that can be deployed efficiently on site to the, the, the design elements that have gone into large desalination facilities. And I think of the co-located power plant example where we use the cooling water for a power plant to heat the incoming water for the desalination plant, which makes the membranes more energy efficient. And it also means you have one less intake into that plant. But the challenge is still there. The challenge of managing energy and managing those operational factors that consume energy and desalination, I think continues to be the, the, the biggest gap. Um, we'll talk maybe in the, a little bit about environmental you know, challenges of discharging the, the concentrated brine, but but I think in just the desalination part, it's energy, no, no question. Thanks, John. And, and as a follow-up question to that and the work that you currently do, um, would there be interest in pursuing additional options such as wave-powered technology to meet those energy needs? Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's already, I don't know, half a dozen, you know, photovoltaic coupled or driven desalination plants in, you know, areas close to the equator around the world. Um, I think there's actually a, in Perth, Australia, I believe, a wave powered, you know, generation, a demonstration plant. So the concept is certainly a, a viable one because, you know, the waves are there, they're a source of energy and building a plant or trans generating and transmitting electricity to desalination plants where they're most economically located it is a significant investment. So um, the, again, the challenge is most of the time when we get involved, the capacity of those desalination plants are so large so that the amount of power required for a large plant is huge. And, and the more power you need to generate continuously, the more, you know, the, the, the long-term, you know, fossil fuel-based technologies tend to, tend to be more economical. As, things, yeah. as time goes on, we hope that that's not true, right? We get more and more economical to generate greener. Thanks, John. And um, Paul, I had a similar question for you in the work that you do and and kind of with your end users. Do you see um, interest in additional options uh, to meet energy or water needs um, through uh, wave power desalination? Yeah, so there's been a lot of talk about um, obviously multiple types of alternate energy um, throughout, say the Caribbean as an example, people have looked at solar, wind and wave. The challenge with the Caribbean is the, the sheer size of the Caribbean um, from, a, from an area, an overall area perspective, and each island is quite unique and different. Um, so having, um, you know, one system that fits all is, is quite a challenge for people. So. Each island tends to look at these, um, these these issues separately, independently. You know, they they're installing some wind in various uh, islands. They've got some solar. Um, you know, and waves um, wave activity in, in each island is is quite different. Um, obviously, the closer you get to the the equator, the the less uh, the tidal movement there is. So you've got to really just focus only on wave uh, act activity. So it just varies throughout the islands, but people are, are definitely looking at uh, trying to find ways. Um, I, I, I know that some people talk about generating energy that's fed to a desalination plant, and then there's some people that are trying to integrate desalination into the actual device. So some people have got a piston type of device that um, operates the pump. Um, I would encourage people to focus on generating electricity. Um, but that's my that's my personal view. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, 
So next question is for you, Bill. Um, part of your work yeah. with the Navy includes the testing and evaluation of desalination and water purification systems. How do you and your role with the Navy or, or as an organization decide if a new technology is worth pursuing and how are these technologies vetted and tested? Um, okay, well, um, well, generally um, what what the Navy or government does is uh, we generally have a need, so a, a, a mission gap, a technology gap. We basically want to do something. So water purification or, or desal, it's, it's generally centered around uh, less energy, uh, reduced maintenance, uh, increased reliability. Um, also, in terms of, uh, you know, scaling it down to smaller scales, uh, it's generally a, it's a, it's a kind of a more unique challenge uh, on the military you know, DOD side um, in terms of, you know, transport. Um, a lot of times we also look at what they call like the technical readiness level of, uh, of a technology. So we would put out, government would put out, you know, requests for proposals or uh, like a solicitation saying, hey, we're, we're interested in technology like a broad agency announcement and, and, and vendors and groups can then submit concepts that can then be reviewed and and generally they look at uh, you know things like technical merit innovation um, you know what is the team's capabilities and and what is when what do we think is that applicability to the to the government mission um, but but generally it's on um, uh, you know, um, size and weight, transportability, because a lot of our equipment has to be moved around and and redeployed. Um, so as far as testing and those types of things, um, you know, generally our group gets involved with, um, you know, pilot scale, demonstration, proof of concept. And so generally if a developer or a group has something, then then at a certain point in the development, they would send us their product or system and then we would set it up at our facility and then test it um, and generally we like to test things you know it's, it's kind of like what is it you're trying to achieve with the test right is it just proof of concept that it works uh, validate some uh, you know uh, capabilities uh, what what I've seen is most people have a general idea of what their system does but they don't know how it uh, what the optimal um, conditions are to operate it they they would say well uh, i need to run some tests to kind of uh, like a test matrix to see well i don't know where this is best optimized so i'm going to run a series of conditions and then once i determine that i'll say okay that's my best condition now i'm going to you know run it at that point for for let's say three months you know I, ideally if you have the resources and time like a nine a 90 day test generally gives you a pretty good sense of the overall reliability of the system. Thanks so much, Bill. And uh, following up on that, um, you discussed kind of the importance of the size of the system. I was wondering if you could um, elaborate on that and kind of what what size of the system, but also in terms of water energy output, would um, you be looking for in terms of the applications uh, and the work well, that you do? Yeah, I think it depends. So like for our, for example, for what we do with, with the Navy here, you know, we're in, we, we look at kind of a, what I call kind of like a family of water systems. So we go down to a individual Marine soldier size, you know, a squad level, platoon level, larger scale system. So that would be like, uh, you know, in terms of output, you know, something like maybe, um, you know, 200 gallons a day at a, at a platoon level, uh, you know, maybe 1,800 gallons a day at a company level, that's like 150 people, and then maybe 1,200 to 1,500 gallons a day, or gallons an hour um, at, um, uh, at like a large, you know, base camp, um, you know, and again, that's more of on our, you know, military forces. If, if we're looking at like, you know, installations or kind of what, you know, would be on a base, a fixed installation, then it, then it would vary depending on the size of the, the, the number of people. That could range anywhere from, 
you know, 25, 50,000 gallons a day to maybe half a million a day or a million gallons a day in large, you know, um, bases and installations. Like, you know, the Navy has Guantanamo Bay down in Cuba and, you know, they have a desal series of desal plants down there and they do like two, you know, one and a half million gallons a day, two million gallons a day of production. I, I think that's our largest one in the, in the government. And then there's various other bases that have different size system, systems. So, um, thanks. Thanks so much, Val. That's, that's, uh, really insightful and really helpful. Um, so uh, next question is is centered around cost, and I wanted to direct this to Paul and John. Um, are costs a significant factor in your consideration when adopting a new technology? And kind of what considerations are given to capital versus O and M costs? Go ahead, Paul. Thank you. So cost obviously is very important, um, particularly uh, into again if I focus on the Caribbean. The cost is a little bit of less of an, an issue when it comes to a disaster um, because often, obviously it's availability and capability that's more important. But uh, ultimately cost obviously is, is extremely important. You know, the capital cost, um, they can often get a loan for the capital cost, um, the actual operating costs. Um, so if, again, if you look at the Caribbean from a, an overall desalination perspective, there's a there's a blend of government owned plants to BOO type plants where um, somebody builds, owns and operates them for a fixed cost. So, you know, different people will will try to um, address how to bring the lowest cost of water to to their end users. I agree with Paul and I would add to it. You know, projects often have a certain scope. And, and the larger you draw the scope, the more you start to bring in aspects that are offset by say higher investment in capital because you have a longer, lower operating cost or, or more robust because you put in more treatment. It costs you more, but over the life of the system, it will run cheaper because you have less membrane replacement, less cleaning, et cetera. So the bigger one draws the envelope of what it costs to put in and, and run and operate a desalination plant, the, the you know, more you can bring in new technologies and say, you know, this technology helps reduce cost in these other ways, so it can cost more initially. And when we look at incorporating a new technology into um, our portfolio and our systems, we try to understand, even if it's higher in operating or higher in capital initially, what is driving the higher cost and will economy of scale and further development bring those costs down? And if you have a pathway towards lower costs, even if it's five years in the future, that there can be a, 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 a motivation to tackling that challenge because you see the long-term benefit of that making your, your offering stronger, because ultimately it will provide an overall lower cost solution, even if you, if you define its box too narrowly and it looks really expensive at the, at the beginning. Just to add um, one additional thing, the, the Caribbean um, is a great example or a great place uh, for people to bring in new innovative technologies. So as an example, um, historically, most of the desalination plants were owned and operated by governments. Uh, BOOs became um, very prevalent um, early on before it really became um, common around the world. And even mobile uh, temporary systems are being, um, you know, containerized seawater reverse osmosis unit gets mobilized to an island. Initially, maybe short term, but often ends up being in operation for much longer. And there's a real mix of desalination um, capability and, and uh, contracting mechanisms in the in the Caribbean. The Trinidad has got, a, I think, a 66 million gallon a day seawater reverse osmosis, um, predominantly used for industrial um, purposes in a specific area um, in Trinidad. But then you can go to a, a, a hotel on an island where they have their own desalination plant. So it's just a real mix of, uh, of of that and different technologies and 
So it's a, a great place to uh, to really try to pursue and bring in invasive technologies. And the, Paul, would you agree that the cost per cubic meter of desalinated water for those different extremes can be widely different because of economy yeah. of scale, technology selected, and how much pretreatment they put in, or types of membranes, or energy recovery. Absolutely, and and a lot of that is, you know, a lot of the Caribbean, the seawater is very good quality compared to, say, Trinidad, where you've got um, water coming out of the Orinoco River, which um, impacts the whole island. So it really is very island specific. But but yes, that that's that's true. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, John. Um, so the next question is around deployment, and this is for uh, Bill and Will. So the systems created for the wastewater prize are meant to be shipped in a container, fully assembled to reduce the installation time and technical skill required. Are there any hurdles to importing such a technology for disaster relief scenarios? You uh, want me on this one? Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Will. Go. Oh. Go ahead. I can think of a bajillion hurdles, um, particularly if it's in an, I mean, most of it comes down to people, but, um, and then gas money, I guess. Um, but yeah, cost to transport and then getting it through customs internationally is always a trick. It's a huge challenge. Yeah, I, I, I would say that, you know, as far as uh, if for the wave to water concept, if it was to be in a container or some some type of modular system, um, you know, something that would like kind of a, a a standard size, like a standard size container or you know, like a quadcon or ISO container or or something like that. Um, but I would also say too, it would be like you know, having them pre-deployed in in key locations i think i think what i've seen what we've seen on the on the navy side or government side is when there's these events it's like they wanted it yesterday why don't you have it there you know the, uh, even if you had the capability the logistics of transporting it from point a to b takes a lot of time and effort and by the time you can do that sometimes the event that's like it's either they figured out another solution or you don't have that kind of time. So if you had something like co-located or, or like what I would call like a backup system at a, at a base or at a location, that's almost what you need to be able to, to um, you know, uh, switch over to that. If, if your mainline infrastructure goes down to, for due to a disaster or, or, or a system failure, you want to have a backup or a redundant system available to you know to be able to switch over, uh, kind of right there and already built in. Um, I think maybe for like the wave power thing, um, you know, that would maybe identifying locations where, you know, that's conducive to that in terms of you know geographic locations or something like that, and trying to figure out you know could could you you know, like say deploy them or put in infrastructure to, you know, deploy that and then take that water and transport it to shore or something like that. Um. Thanks, Val. Um, and then Paul, I was wondering uh, from your perspective, are there any additional hurdles to importing such a technology for longer term use in a coastal community, for example? Um, you know, interfacing with um, with existing infrastructure, I think, is is often a challenge. Um, you know, you, if you're generating power from, you know, a, a, a wave a device, um, how do, what are you connected to? Um, do you connect it to an existing microgrid or an existing grid which may be down? Um, you know, and and the, the length of the cable that you need. Um, to get good access to uh, to the site, you know, so there's a lot of logistics issues, uh, and obviously that's going to vary from location to location. Thanks, Paul. Um, and so, uh, in terms of logistics, uh, I have a follow-up question. This this for Paul and John. Um, what sort of regulations or permitting have to be considered when deploying a desalination system? 
Um, it varies tremendously. So if, if you take the United States as an example, um, you have extreme cases. If you look at California on one end of the spectrum versus um, Texas or even Louisiana, Louisiana is probably one of the easier to permit. But Texas um, is initially was thought to be very, very easy to do. Um, but it's becoming a little more challenging with the EPA stepping in uh, over TCEQ. Um, but in the Caribbean, um, there's very little, um, you know, often what will happen is the supplier of the equipment will have a, a more stringent uh, in, uh, requirement for brine discharge or those sorts of things. So, you know, many islands don't have many limitations. Yeah. You know you know, we, the, most, the biggest challenge we face is the content of the brine discharge. Um, a lot of times we want to run as high recovery as we can on the membranes. It reduces the size of the intake. You get more pure water from it, but that has two consequences. One, it pushes your salinity up even higher. So it has a bigger need to be careful about where you discharge it back into the ocean. So it doesn't affect um, uh, marine life that's that's close to the shore, and also the chemicals that we use to inhibit scale formation on membranes have to be you know um, bio, you know environmentally safe, and you know those things exist, but they're not as always effective as some of the older chemicals which we don't like to use when we're discharging back into the environment. So. Um, there's a rigorous review of chemicals used and discharged with your brine, as well as the TDS and where that brine is going. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, John. Um, so I did promise that we would leave some time at the end uh, for any questions from the audience. Um, so I just wanted to open it up now if you had any questions for any of the panelists or speakers today. And feel free to send questions in the chat. Um, So I have a question for Will. Uh oh, no, no, it's what um, battery technology do you use um, for storing energy in your systems? Because I think you said you deploy both the the generation of power and the storage of power in your solutions. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, we try to get, we try to outfit systems as much as possible with uh, lithium ferrous phosphate batteries or yeah. cells which are the safest accessible you know market ready kind of plug and play storage that has the biggest depth of discharge you know safest all that stuff i also say we deploy whatever is free so we like free batteries better than you know that's the best yeah. chemistry of battery <laughs> Um, so, so we do a lot of upcycling, reusing, repurposing of, of batteries. And so we'll deploy anything that's not a single source fossil fuel generator. Um, but yeah, when we can get, when we can fund or find LFP battery storage, that's what we prefer. Thanks. I see a question for from Gilbert. Uh, what is the minimal water production for disaster relief, in your opinion? That is totally site dependent. And I would say that, like, I mean, I'll just jump in and please, if anybody else um, jumps in, please. Um, but it's I think a lot of times we get the the disaster response community gets hung up on trying to do all of it at once and go really big and not and forgets that like a little bit of water or a little bit of power is can be game changing if deployed appropriately so i i mean the answer is as much as physically possible right that's the particularly in large scale disaster outages where or disasters in general where you know power water shelter food connectivity are all essential and they come become essential very very quickly for a vast number overwhelming number of people but um particularly with our work we've noticed that a you know a lot of times 
we'll get a fire department that says like, yeah, we need to run our entire depart, you know, building. Do you have a solar trailer that can plug into our building? We often say no, but we can power your Wi-Fi and your fridge. And if that changes the game, if that reduces or, or eliminates their need to send a human to get gas driving two hours to Mississippi or whatever to refill their generator and instead they can use that person for something else, that can, is effectively game changing. So I'd say like, as long as you know, particularly for the folks that have worked through this challenge, as long as you know what your customer needs, like they're, what they want and what they need might be vastly different. And we see that all the time with, hey, we, we run a 20 kVA generator and what they're doing is charging their Wi-Fi, you know, like that is a, so oversized for what they need and they think what they want is a 20 kVA power system and what they need is two, right? So I'd be, I wouldn't, I'd say the minimal is whatever that site or whatever that client is using, right? And that's, that's the real, the gap in information for both water and power, I think is significant. Um, so I do that. We spend a lot of time doing site assessments before we deploy any equipment, simply because what people say over the phone and what they need in real life are usually vastly different. So I, I don't know much about, you know, some of the ins and outs of electricity generation and storage, but the question I often get involved in is what's the largest single phase pump that you can support? Um, and then what pressure can we generate? And the more uh, saline the water is, the more that pressure goes to desalination, less volume you create, the more breath potable it is, then the less pressure you need and the more water you can filter. Um, but starting that question with what, you know, is the available supply of power? And if in, in some cases it's single phase or it's uh, direct current, if it's coming from a battery bank or photovoltaic panel, we start with the motor and then we try to put what pumping energy we can do on that and then filter as much water as we can with the available pressure generated. So kind of an engineering backwards way of looking at it, but that just shows you the importance of the power generation in a lot of these filtration solutions. We have the technology, but powering it is, is an essential piece of the design. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Will. And Thanks, John. Um, I do want to be cognizant of the time. I know we're we're at the end of uh, the time we had allotted. So I just wanted to thank everyone for joining today. Thank you to all the speakers and panelists. Um, just an abundance of knowledge that uh, and perspective that we had on the call today. Um, as a reminder, this recording will be available on the Engineering for Change website uh, following uh, today's meeting. Uh, and wanted to wish all of you a great rest of your day and thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, our pleasure. Great, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.